Okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we talk about a very important issue this afternoon, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to receive the truth, that you would uh, hide me behind the cross, that you would speak through me, and that you would humble me and have me only say things that bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So two weeks ago when I was here, we talked about uh, how you get to October 22nd, 1844. Yes. I don't know if this is appropriate. Speak up loud, please. Huh? Speak up. I don't know. Should I read it? It's like a couple paragraphs. Sure. It kind of pertains to what you're talking about. But you need the mic. Yeah. It doesn't come across. Yeah. Yeah. Your voice away, let me stick it back in. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is out of Maranatha, page 45. It's uh, February 6th. She says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidence of their faith. They have no justification or appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find, upon examining the positions they hold, that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they know not their great ignorance. And there are many in a church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. God will arouse his people if no other means fail. Heresies will come among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. The Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Precious light has to come, appropriate for this time. Believers are not to rest in suppositions and ill-defined ideas of what constitutes truth. Their faith must be firmly founded upon the word of God so that when the testing time shall come and they are brought before councils to answer for their faith, they may be able to give a reason for the hope that is in them with meekness and fear. Amen. Couldn't have picked a better verse to illustrate that. So today, see the problem is One of the reasons that we're here in this house today is because uh, people wanted to study the Word of God for themselves. And not to be dictated to by some person with a special degree that claimed that he had knowledge above what they could have, right? And so um, we're all in a condition where we need to be able to give an account for the things that we believe. And I'm going to read here a quote out of the Great Controversy because um, I've realized through the last year or so that even among those that, that think they understand this prophecy here, that they really don't understand all the big picture. This is Great Controversy, page 334. What's that? The title of the study? Oh, 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 um, uh, it's um, an American reformer. The title of the study? I don't know yet. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. 1840, sometime in the month of August. 
And only a few months previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period of 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before de Cozy's ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Josiah Litch, Signs of the Times. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent message. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and publishing his views. And from 1840 to 44, the work rapidly extended. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy that the, the time period of 1840 to 44 was what? A wonderful manifestation of the power of God. So according to spirit of prophecy, the years 1840 to 44 was a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And according to the great controversy, the understanding of the woes are what caused a great impetus in Adventism. And brothers and sisters, Adventism in a real way was established on the principles of Revelation chapter 9. And what was at the heart of Revelation chapter 9 and the woes? Absolutely. A day for a year principle. But the thing is, we know this as Seventh-day Adventists, most of us, but what is the whole story of August 11th, 1840, and what was the event that actually really took place? Why is this important? Because there are Seventh-day Adventist theologians that are saying the event never transpired. You understand what I'm saying? There, look. They're, they're at the church that I go to sometimes, there's a former head elder there. He just stepped down from the position. And there's a quote in Mrs. White's writings. She says in the quote, she starts out, this is what she says in the first sentence. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. And yet there are theologians in Adventism and many of our pastors that are saying that never happened. Do you realize, do you realize, think about this for a second. If you say that event never happened, not only are you a liar, because brothers and sisters, if you do the, some research, you'll see that it did happen. But you're also saying that Ellen White's a false prophet. Why? Amen. I mean, absolutely. <coughs> What she said, it's like those people that say the Holocaust never happened. Now I have first-hand, or I don't know if it's first-hand or second-hand information. I'll tell you this, uh, th this is a sidebar, I just want to establish this as a fact. Uh, when I first came into Adventism, I was studying with two generals. And at the time, they were the only two Seventh-day Adventist generals uh, until that guy Barry Black, who's an admiral, uh, he, and you know him. And this guy, his name was Larry Fuller, okay? And he became a Seventh-day Adventist along with his uh, um, uh, West Point buddy, uh, Del Munson. And Larry Fuller, he was a smart guy. In fact, he graduated number one in his class from West Point in 1940. Okay? Well, by the end of the war, he was one of General Patton's assistants. Okay? He was a major by then. And you know, General Patton was spearheading the invasion 
into Germany, right? Because he wanted to be the first one there. And so when General Patton would send units ahead scouting, one of these units was headed by this guy, Larry Fuller, who at the time was a major. He would eventually become a general and even um, uh, in, uh, very high up in the Pentagon. But at this time, he was a major. And it was his unit with him and his men that were spearheading into uh, occupied territory. They were the first Americans to discover a concentration camp and liberate it. And believe me, it happened. It really happened. And they were completely in shock that things were in that condition. So uh, uh, it happened. And this happened. But the question is, what is it that happened? Because it's kind of like this. As Seventh-day Adventists, we say, well, we believe in October 1844. Really? Prove it. Well, I, I just know I believe it. OK. Prove it. So here's the same thing. I hope this isn't making you guys uncomfortable. <laughs> but the thing, the thing is, we have these charts up here on the wall, right? We, believe, we say we believe in the first woe and the second woe, and that it was a remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but what actually happened? What happened, brothers and sisters, on August 11, 1840, that fulfilled Bible prophecy? Yeah, but what happened? Okay, that's, that's good. That's good, but why? Look here. In, in paragraph two, anybody that has a great controversy, look at this. Well, paragraph, the first paragraph is on 334. This paragraph is on 335. It says, at the very time specified. Okay? At the very time specified. This was the date that Josiah Litch said. Okay? Now, originally, in, in, in Josiah Litch's 1838 exposition, he didn't know that it would happen on August 11th. He just said sometime in August 1840. Okay? But on the 1st of August, he said no. How, how, okay. I gave a presentation last night. And we're not going to get into this. This, this. The presentation I gave last night, it wasn't a lack, I mean, it wasn't an exciting presentation or anything like that. It's locked up in the archives. But it's locked in the archives because I said something that's, well, I'm making, I guess, sort of a prediction in some regards. But I'm not a prophet, and I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm just merely using uh, prophecy. prophecy to say, well, I believe this is going to happen, right? Now, how would you like to be this? Let's go back in time for a minute. In 1838, OK, how about this? I'll, I'll give you an analogy. It's 1985. And you go to your friends and you say, Saddam Hussein is going to be overthrown. Who? Saddam Hussein, you know, the president of uh, Iraq or the dictator or whatever you want to call him. OK. He's going to be he's going to be toppled from power and he's going to be toppled from power on August 11th. 2003. What are your friends going to say to you? How do you know, right? And why? So here it is. Josiah Litch, for two years, he's saying, in August 1840, the Ottoman supremacy will cease. Really? Because they've been ruling the, the whole Middle East for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And he's saying, no, no, it's going to cease. And then what happens? When the August time comes, 
on, on August 1, he writes this article right here in the Signs of the Times, August 1, 1840. So usually when the time comes closer, usually the person goes, well, you know, I could be wrong. Because that's what I said last night. I could be wrong. But instead of saying, well, man, you know, instead of the beads of sweat coming down and him saying, well, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, I could be wrong. No, 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 not Josiah Litch. Jo Josiah Litch comes out with another paper on the 1st of August, and he goes, not only is Ottoman supremacy going to be broken, it's going to be broken in 11 days. I'm telling you right now, the Ottoman Empire is going to cease to exist as we've known it in 11 days. That's pretty bold. And then guess what happens? It happens, but here's the problem. They didn't have satellite telephones, and they didn't have all the things that we have today. So it took some time. They didn't have the telegraph. By the way, what year was the telegraph invented? 1844. <laughs> they didn't have the telegraph. You don't think the telegraph and the telephone and all these major forms of communication, that it's not significant that that invented in 1844? I guarantee you it is. Look, this guy was so sure that 11 days before he put his extra stamp on it and said, this is going to happen. And it took a few weeks. In fact, it wasn't really until December of that year of 1840 when all the facts came out and that's why she says here what does she say she says when it became known when it became known because it it took some time okay brothers and sisters I want to say this right here 9-11 2001 happened a little while back and even though we're in a modern age with lots of communication and everything, you know the mere fact that there's a lot of communication actually makes it harder to communicate. I'll give you for instance. I don't espouse watching television, but you know when I was a kid, you only had like four or five channels, right? So the next day at school, everybody was talking about what they watched on TV last night. You guys remember that? Now it's a different world because now there is so much. There are hundreds of TV channels. There are hundreds of things to occupy the mind, thousands of things, right? So it's harder for information to get through now because there are so many channels of information. I believe when this becomes known that I think that multiple, multitudes will come on board. And Ellen White says here, when it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Do you know for history to be repeated, we have to understand this, brothers and sisters, because if you don't understand this, you can't understand this. And this is what the people need to hear. Because this is the second angel's message. When Mrs. White was shown in vision, that when she saw when the great buildings of New York fall, that what? Babylon. The Babylon the great is fallen as fallen. In other words, a repeat of the second angel's message. And the second angel's message is the last message of warning. Right, let, me, let me put it this way. The second angel's message is repeated by the fourth angel. And that angel is the last angel's message that will ever be given to the whole world. Because that angel is given at the right time, according to Ellen White, to help the third angel's message swell to a loud cry. That angel, that message, is given by God to fit up God's people to stand at the last test. Yes. This message right here and this message right here are connected. We need to be able to understand the event that transpired at this specific time right here. Why 
did Ottoman supremacy cease? Why did that happen? But notice, if you go up, there are some clues. Does everybody have their great controversy? Let me go up here and say this. Again, starting at the beginning, page 334. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited in widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. 1840 sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period of 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before D. Cozies ascended the throne by permission of the Turks. There is your clue right there. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a little, what I do with my, uh, uh, here it is. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to do, okay? So, in the year 1449, it's on this chart right here. You see this? 1449. That was the termination date of the first woe. Not the beginning, but the termination date. What happened in 1449? The end of the first woe. What happened? Guys, this is the message that but really began Adventism. Yes? I got Josiah's lips. Positions on this third woe. He said, specified time for the continuance of Turkish or Mohammedan supremacy with the Greeks. It was an hour, a day, a month, and a year. Okay. I think that's how you spell it, isn't it? Yes. In 1449, the king or emperor, the last Roman emperor, the second to the last actually, technically, he was dying. His brother, this guy right here was going to take his place. But at the time that this was all going on in 1449, the Roman Empire had ceased to exist as a far-flung world-dominating empire and shrunk all the way down to a little area in Greece known in a place called Constantinople, the city that Constantine founded. And who do you think they were surrounded by? The Ottoman Empire. And so in 1449, this guy right here asked permission to rule. Permission to rule. And he got the permission to rule from who? The Sultan. In other words, it's kind of like this. Remember, remember the guy that went into captivity in Babylon named Manasseh? And when, the, when they sent him back as king, when they let him out of jail later on, was he autonomous? No. In other words, he was a vassal king, right? So in 1449, when you ask permission from the sultan to rule, you're, you're not autonomous. You're, you're, you're ruling at the dictates of another power. You're, 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 you're admitting you have an authority over you, right? 
Okay, so what happens here, this is the event. See, all prophecies are, are, are tied to an event. One of the things that helps us understand prophecy is to understand the event. Because Miller's rules say prophecy and history doth agree, right? So if we can learn the event, it'll help us to understand the prophecy. Okay, so 391 years, 15 days from the point where this guy got permission from this guy brings us to August 11, 1840. And what happens here? Again, that's the, that's the first question. Emma basically told us in a one-liner what happened, but what really happened? Because she says here, at the time, at the very time specified, August 11, 1840, 30, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and placed herself under the control of Christian nations. So you know what happens here? This guy, this guy, he believes he's a Christian, right? And he gets permission from who? Islam. To rule. And then 391 years, 15 days later, the same thing happens in reverse. In reverse. But why? There was a civil war in Islam. A civil war. And what happened was in the civil war that the governor of Egypt, Egypt at the time was a province of, of this Ottoman Empire. And the governor of Egypt, he was not Egyptian, in fact, I believe he was even born in what we would consider present-day Greece. And he was governor of Egypt, and he became very powerful, a very powerful governor. And eventually, he made a decision that he wasn't going to be just governor anymore. He was going to rule all of Islam. And so a civil war developed. And during the civil war, the this guy's name was Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. That should be easy to remember. I don't know if he floated like a butterfly, but he did invade the Ottoman Empire from Egypt, and he was making headway and made it all the way up to Syria, which we call present-day Lebanon. And his forces were in a place known as Beirut. Beirut used to be called the, uh, the Riviera of the East before all the wars and stuff happened there. And um, on August 11th, 1840, an end was put to the advance of Muhammad Ali's forces, they were going to drive all the way to Constantinople and they were going to take over the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottomans cried out to help for the, from the four great powers of Europe, Russia, Austria, who else? Russia. Prussia and England, right? And they said, help us because Muhammad Ali's army wiped out a Ottoman Empire army and there was nothing that really stood in their way from capturing Constantinople. I that that's probably a fact that I need to look into more. So we should 
we should go deeper into this thing. But what happens is, is that on August 11th, 1840, an, an event transpires. There are two events that are actually transpiring. And, there, and, and, and one group doesn't know that the other group is, it, it, the event is actually happening. The ambassadors of the Ottoman Empire are negotiating with the four great powers to enter into a deal for protection. On the very day that that protection was accepted, Commodore Charles Napier, write this down, Commodore Charles Napier showed up off the coast of Beirut with a small squadron of warships. And on August 11th, 1840, he contained or restrained the army of Muhammad Ali. Literally. Now, according to the history books, he couldn't overthrow them because he didn't have enough forces. But those forces would arrive one month later. So here it is, Napier with his squadron, Commodore Napier, restrains Islam, Muhammad Ali's forces at Beirut in, in, in a blockade. 30 days later, from August 11th, 1840, takes you to when? 30 days later brings you to September 11th, 1840. And what happened September 11th, 1840? Admiral Stock, uh, what was his, uh, what was it? No, no, no. I have to look this up. But I think it was, uh, it was Stock something. St Stopford. Stopford. Admiral Stopford shows up with the Mediterranean fleet. And, and he shows up on September 11th. So the squadron is there on August 11th, restrains them. But on September 11th, the fleet shows up, the rest of the fleet. And they once again give orders for Muhammad Ali's forces to surrender. And they don't. An open war breaks out on September 11th, 1840, when the Allies start shelling the city. OK? So war broke out. On this day right here. And what happens here is this. If you go back to 1449, this guy got permission from this guy, and the Sultan took the city anyway in open war. 391 years, 15 days later, in a civil war in Islam, Islam is restrained in two ways. Physically, literally restrained by, by Charles Napier's forces that show up. But they are also spiritually restrained because Turkey, through her ambassadors, signs an accord with the four great powers of Europe and transfers their authority over to them so that they can be protected from the bad guys that are destroying them, OK? And when you give your authority over to somebody else, they become what? Your master. Whom you yield yourself servants to obey, they become your masters, right? Those that wouldn't agree with the Christian nations suffered the wrath of the nations because open war broke out 30 days later on September 11th, 1840, Christian nations attacked Islam, right? So here's the significance of this. What happened on August 11, sorry about this, so used to write in 1800s, on August 11th, 18, 1988, Anybody have a search in their phone or anything? Oh, that's right. The wall came down in 
No, no, 1989. Not 1989. Remember what happened here, August 11th, 1840? Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of Christian nations, and Islam was literally restrained by Commodore Napier. 30 days later, Christian nations attacked Islam. August 11th, 1888, the official day that Osama bin Laden founded Al-Qaeda. On August 11th, 1888. 1988. Al-Qaeda was founded, and then on September 11th, in a perfect chiastic structure, 2001, Al-Qaeda attacked the United States of America. A complete reverse. So here, what you have is Islam is laying down its authority August 11th, 1840, and then Christian nations attacking the remnant of Islam on September 11th, 1840. In a reverse order of that, Al-Qaeda is formed wanting to take jihad to the entire world on August 11th, 1988, and they bring that dream to reality September 11th, 2001 total fact on all accounts. And if you think that, you can make this up. I think it's so solid. When I, I didn't, I, I only recently, about six months ago, discovered that Al-Qaeda was founded on August 11th, 1988. And when I saw that, I about jumped out of my skin. Because I said, that actually is a perfect chiastic structure and everything in reverse order that proves to me that we are in the third woe and that the third woe is Islam. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. And why is this important? Because when this part right here became known, it gave a great impetus to the Advent movement. And so when this, this, and this become known, I think it's going to shine 10 times brighter. If we can illustrate in a simple, and I'm not saying what I did today was simple by no means, but if we can illustrate it simply and show to the people that this happened right here, which led to this happening right here, which led to this, this, and all this, and by the way, 9-11 in Bible prophecy I think that people are going to really go crazy. They're going to see this. Now, Seventh-day Adventists may not go crazy, but according to the Bible, according to Spirit of Prophecy right here, it gave great impetus to the Advent movement. And I believe, and you know, I don't know who the one is to do this, to formulate a message to show the people at the end of the world how Islam prefigures in Bible prophecy I think that that would really give great impetus to the movement at the end of the world here. Yes? So that August 11th, 1840 was the ending of the first woe. Where does the second woe begin and end? No, no, no. This is the end of the... Uh, August 11th was the end of the second woe. Yes. Five oh eight. Um, no, well, five oh eight is the. Uh, it, it's it's an event that marks the beginning of two other time prophecies that are related in re, in the fact that they're on these charts together. Now, look, as Seventh Day Adventists, we understand this: that John the Baptist ate wild honey and locusts, right? And we understand through Spirit of Prophecy that the locusts were what? Right, locust beans, okay? But nonetheless, why are locust beans called locust beans? Kind of look like a locust, right? I mean, when they're green. So here's the thing. I don't know, but here's the thing. Islam is likened unto a locust, right? And, at the, and, and John the Baptist's diet was honey, and locusts. And if you look at this chart right here, the prophecies of the book of Daniel are considered to be sweet as honey, 
And Islam is considered to be locus. And so at the end of the world, if we're kind of like another John the Baptist, our diet needs to be the locusts and the honey. Because if we can reconvey to the people, because the loud cry is soon to go to the world, right? The first, second, and third angel's message. And these messages of, the, of, that, of our foundational teachings, we really need to learn. I mean, you know, we, we, we've been having these things in our possession for a while, and we really need to start feasting on understanding these things. I mean, let's just study this stuff and learn the three angels' message and learn about Islam and Bible prophecy and focus on the understanding the heavenly sanctuary and being able to prove that, coming, you know, pressing together as a people so that, and coming up with ways to make it easier to understand and, and be able to explain it quickly because we're told that in the last days a great work will be done in a short time. But, you know, look, here's the thing. Everybody at the end of the world here can relate to 9-11. And if we, can, if we can use that and illustrate that, hey, Adventism has been talking about Islam and prophecy for 170 years plus, you know you cannot turn on the news. You cannot turn on the news and have one 15-minute news segment, segment go by where Islam is not talked about. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. It can't be done. I've tried it. Literally. I'm like, okay, let me check on CNN. Let me go online. Look, nine out of ten times when I go online and I do my little research on CNN or Fox News or ABC or whatever it is just to get the headlines and and main, main reason I'm doing it is to see if the Sunday law got passed that day or something right what happens is I go on there first things on there ISIS ISIS this ISIS that Jerusalem this Palestinians this Pa Hamas this, the deal breaks down with Iran this, attack in Yemen this, the Saudis raise the oil prices that. And it's one thing after another. And isn't it amazing that God gave us a message at the foundation of our faith that we laid down and if we had been faithful to what God had gave us at the foundation, the world would be coming to us and say, how did you know all these things were going to happen? because the Bible says it and that the third woe would be coming on the earth and the third woe is a representation of the descendants of Ishmael and every man's hand would be against his and his hand would be against every man and by the way there's a angry horse in this prophecy that Mrs. White saw that is struggling to break loose and bring death and destruction over the whole face of the earth amen and that's going to happen. So we should all endeavor to understand these events and come up with ways to figure out how to explain them more easily and quicker and all these things. OK? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for for giving us time but time is almost up for us your hand will be stretched to save those that have never heard but our probation is about to close and I pray Lord that you would actuate each one of us here to take the time necessary to understand the truths that we advocate so that we can give the loud cry message is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you go, I want to read one more quote here. I want to read one more quote. And I... It's found in Great Controversy, page... It's in found in Great Controversy, page 598. Actually, it starts on 597. 
And here's where it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, 25. Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin. When there are every opportunity to know the will of God. A man is traveling and comes to a place where there are several roads and a guideboard including where each one leads. If he disregards the guideboard and takes whichever road seems to him be right, he may be ever so sincere but will in all probability find himself on the wrong road. God has given us his word that we may become acquainted with its teachings and know for ourselves what he requires of us. When the lawyers came to Jesus with the inquiry, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Savior referred him to the scriptures saying, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Ignorance will not excuse young or old or release them from the punishment due for the transgression of God's law. Because there is in the hands of a faithful of the faithful a presentation of the law and of its principles and its claims. It is not enough to have good intentions. It is not enough to do what a man thinks is right or what the minister tells him is right. His soul salvation is at stake and he should search the scriptures for himself. However strong may be his convictions, however confident he may be that the minister knows what is truth, this is not his foundation. He has a chart pointing out every waymark on the heavenward journey, and he ought not to guess at anything. It is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scriptures what is truth, and then to walk in the light and encourage others to, and follow, his, to follow his example. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing scripture with scripture with divine help. We are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. So, the fact that we don't understand a lot of the things that we believe is not an excuse. We can't go before the Lord and say, Lord, we believe, but we couldn't give the loud cry because we really didn't know how to explain it. At the end of the world, there's only two classes of people. You're either going to be giving the loud cry or you're not. Simple as that. And that message right there is the loud cry message. It just needs to go to the world in a loud cry.